Hello, and welcome to today's Ninja Trader ecosystem event. What are most traders doing they're not aware of? Find out and make it your competitive advantage. My name is Chris, and I'm a platform representative at Ninja Trader. Before we start the webinar, I have a few housekeeping notes. Secondly, this webinar is presented by Ninja Trader LLC, which is the technology company responsible for developing and supporting the Ninja Trader trading software. Brokerage related questions should be directed to Ninja Trader Brokerage using the phone number or email on screen. Lastly, if you are new to Ninja Trader, please make sure you sign up for a free Ninja Trader account, which includes access to 14 days of complimentary real time market data. Our platform is always free for advanced charting, strategy backtesting, and trade simulation. You could create your free account by following the link on the screen and clicking Get Started under the Welcome section. And before I turn the mic over to Adam, it is important to understand that futures, foreign currency, and options trading contain substantial risk and is not suitable for every investor. It is possible to lose all or more than the initial investment. Risk capital is money that can be lost without jeopardizing one's financial security or lifestyle. Only risk capital should be used for trading, and only those with sufficient risk capital should consider trading. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Also, please remember that these training sessions are not a solicitation nor recommendation, but simply educational in nature. Thanks again for joining us today. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome to the Ninja Trader webinar room, Adam. Hi, everybody. Thank you to Ninja Trader for organizing this event. And well done to everybody for taking time out of your schedule to delve deeper into the world of trading. And with that, let's get into it. Uh, a quick introduction, as it's relevant to what I'll be sharing. My name is Adam Fisk. My finance career started in the early 2000s. My background includes trading for sophisticated investors across stocks, futures, and options as an advisor for a wealth management stockbroking firm. Later in my career, when a futures trading firm expanded by opening an office across the road, the allure of trading alongside highly experienced specialists and ex-floor traders proved irresistible. So I left the security of portfolio management to trade today in the futures debt market. By multinational and close the off where I was fat, not keen on moving across states and uprooting manly. I'm independent trading. Even my industry training, I also mentor a select group of people each year who are serious about taking their trading to a professional level. And so now on to what most people do in their trading and what they're not aware of. And maybe you're doing it too. Let's find out what that is. Plus, let's also find out how you can get competitive advantage. And don't worry about taking notes. If you'd like to receive a track script, I'll let you know how at the end. Tell me if this sounds familiar. You enter a trade, you feel your heart racing as you watch the price move underwater. You've made a mistake and have no choice but to crystallize a loss. What happens next? Suddenly price moves as you'd planned. So you jump back in with a feeling of excitement and relief. You're going to make back that loss and some in a hot minute. But then price moves against you for a second time at another loss. And now you're feeling drained and frustrated. Everyone's had this experience, right? Well, in a minute, you're going to learn why it happens and how you can avoid it. And not only that, but how you can monetize it because it happens to everyone. So that's a lot of opportunity. But first, have you noticed how the traders you read about, hear about, who books are written about, who are interviewed on podcasts all have what in common? They all come from professional trading backgrounds, managing money, proprietary trading firms, that type of thing, right? So why not find out how you compare to an industry trained trader while in a trade? Because wouldn't it be great to know if you can think along? Watching live minute by minute market observations and decisions about managing a real trade, you can discover how your thinking compares. So if you're up for the challenge, I've created a special opportunity just for today. Simply go to the link on the slide, bosstrading.link forward slash GFI, and see how you go thinking along. And now let's get back to what most people do in their trading and how you can make it your competitive advantage. Did you know there's a part of your brain that can overpower rational thinking, logic, and even the will to live? 
Psychologists James Olds and Peter Milner inserted an electrode into a region of a rat's brain, which is now referred to as the pleasure center. The rat could self-administer an electrical current to its pleasure center by pressing a lever. The sensation was so pleasurable that the rat endured the pain of running across an electrified grid just to get its charge. The rat ignored food and drink and kept pressing the lever until it died of exhaustion. The scientific name for the pleasure center is nucleus accumbens. When stimulated, it releases the feel-good chemical dopamine, responsible for your energy, your motivation, and your drive. All that good stuff you want in your trading. But it's in the timing of its release that's going to help you understand a whole lot about what you do when you're trading and what most other people are doing when trading. A surprise anticipation of a reward triggers the release of dopamine. In the early 90s, Wolfram Schultz is professor of neuroscience at Cambridge University and his team had a revelation. To an unsuspecting monkey, revealing a piece of apple sent the monkey's neurons wild. The feel-good chemical dopamine was signaling to the brain, hey, here comes a reward. But the dopamine neurons stopped firing when the monkey realized the treat was on its way. So the key to dopamine release is surprise. Make a mental note. It's about surprise. You know, when you trade, an internal conflict takes place. You see, it's your innate human tendency to find a pattern amongst the randomness of market behavior. It's no different to people who swear they see patterns and repeating sequences when playing the pokies. But it's a struggle to predict exactly when that pattern will appear for a reward to take place. And it's this struggle amongst the chaos, whether it be at the pokies or at the trading screens, which sends your dopamine neurons into overdrive, getting super active. So if you've ever wondered why you took a trade for seemingly no reason, it turns out that stimulating your dopamine neurons is the root cause. And being medically proven, it's why market-making firms like Susquehanna International Group, also known as SIG, they're a billion-dollar-a-year revenue company, have an edge in the market because they know this stuff. And you're about to know it also. I'll show you. Using MRI scans, in their first experiment, Dr. Hans Breeter of Northwestern University and his team administered cocaine to a cocaine addict. Where you see dots of red and yellow, that's right on the nucleus accumbens, the pleasure center. And these colors represent the turning on of your reward system, firing up your dopamine. But the next experiment involves subjects playing games of monetary reward. And guess what? None of Breeder's team predicted MRI scans of cocaine addicts anticipating a cocaine infusion looked exactly like the MRI scans of healthy control subjects in anticipating a monetary win. So the point here is anticipation is fundamental to your experience, aka what you feel about a future reward. Emphasis is in the future, reward in the future. Pokey game designer Michael Shackelford, he's um, also known as the Wizard of Odds, has made a fortune designing games that are guaranteed to lose because he and the entire slot machine industry know people are vulnerable when anticipating a reward. Let me explain. If someone does get lucky and gets a huge reward on the pokies, why don't they walk away? Why do people not walk away from the betting tables if they've had a win? Let me show you something. The image you're looking at is showing you the spike in dopamine you receive in anticipating a reward if you put on a trade. It's so powerful that the anticipation of reward spike in dopamine is what causes you to put on a trade that you immediately wonder, why the heck did I do that? Anticipation gets the better of you and you can't help but jump into a trade. But look what happens once you enter the trade. Can you see how your dopamine immediately drops? So the reason why someone keeps playing the pokies after they've had a win is because the feeling of reward doesn't come from the win. It comes from the anticipation of a win. This explains why someone jumps into a trade and then when dopamine drops, comes to their senses and gets out of the trade because it's no longer a feel-good feeling now that you're in the trade. 
but then all of a sudden jumps back in again and so on. Make sense? So remember the first slide. In anticipation of a reward, you enter a trade and feel your heart racing as you watch the prior move underwater. You've made a mistake and you have no choice but to crystallize a loss. With your dopamine spike now over, guess what happens next? You are now unknowingly vulnerable to yet another spike in dopamine. Suddenly price moves as you'd planned. And there's your anticipation reward spike in dopamine and you jump back in. Can you see how this all works now? When you trade, you repeat going through an experience of anticipation of reward. The rat, each trade is a jolt in electricity from your reward system. But what makes this cycle so powerful? You might think you'd never be one of those people who gets addicted to playing the pokies. But what about making unnecessary trades? You get it nudged along when your dopamine spikes to enter a trade because you feel a trader at the screens, you should be trading. I'm not making money if I'm not in a trade, so I'm itching to get into a trade. I can't call myself a trader if I'm not trading. I better get in. I've set aside this time to trade, so I better put on trade. This is what makes you vulnerable to putting on poorly timed trades or trades that you know are completely subpar trades, right? So with all this vulnerability, what happens next? Look, every day, the top tale of looking for patterns, uncertainty, reward anticipation, and the associated neurochemicals is expressed by people buying and selling without knowing what's driving their actions. And skilled traders know this and profit from it. Let me show you. The following trades you'll see are all trades that had planned to trade the long side. The blue arrows are buyers, the pinker sells. And while you can see the long trade is made, before the long trade is a short. Now, the plan all along was the long trade based around an idea about why price would move up. But the short trade, which isn't the main focus, the short trade takes advantage of people who are in a hurry to jump in and get long, spurred on by the anticipation reward spike in their dopamine. Now, the trades on the screen, they're actually from yesterday. But whether it's yesterday or three months ago or even three years ago, it happens all the time. And who does it happen to? To answer... Have you been shaken out of a trade, taken a loss, and then sat on the sidelines seeing the market move without you? Of course, right? It happens to most people in the market. So it begs the question, is there a connection between what most people do in markets and how markets function? Look, if you understand the must play a role in passing money from one group of traders to another, then you know the market needs you to make poor trade choices correct? And what better way to do it than prey on vulnerabilities? Vulnerabilities most people are completely oblivious to. Make sense? Think of slot machines. They're terrible bets, yet they successfully prey on people's vulnerabilities by combining positive music with beautiful graphics and flashing lights. And they are even programmed in such a way to trick people into thinking certain patterns are occurring. It's all geared towards getting people to act using the science of anticipation of a reward. So what's your best defense? Your best defense against it starts quite simply with being aware the market needs you to make poor trades and prey on your surprise anticipation of a reward. You see, when you're sitting at the screens and top of mind is, what's the market doing to suck me in? Suddenly, you're playing a different game than you've been playing before. Agree? It's like getting into the boxing ring. You know that once the fight starts, blows are coming your way. So you've got your dukes up to protect yourself, right? Which is the complete opposite of someone who is king hit from behind, never knowing it's coming and why often these king hits lead to fatalities. My point is, knowing it's coming is a game changer. When asked about his stellar performance in the Market Wizards books or interviews, Mark Weinstein said, I have a real fear of markets. What he meant by that is he knows about the danger and so his process is developed to safely navigate the dangers. You don't cross a busy intersection without first looking both ways. And why is that? Because you know of the pending danger. Your best defense starts with knowing about the, the danger. And so far today, we've discussed a danger which you're now aware of. 
a danger that hurts many people when they trade. But because it's so prevalent, why limit trading to only avoiding this danger? When you think about just how many people are caught out, it's a massive opportunity for genuine competitive advantage. If you can be the minority taking the other side of the majority when they're making bad trades, agree? But the bars on the charts don't tell you who the traders buying or selling are or what's motivating them to do so, correct? So how can you tell? You're probably familiar with the term playbook trade, but for those who are not, when you have an idea about prices will move, so here's an example. Hong Kong just recently reduced stamp duty of stock trading to reinvigorate the market. It's considered bullish for the market, but buying into the Hong Kong market is too obvious. So we can express that idea by looking for a long trade in the Australian dollar futures instead. Okay, so that's a unique idea and the details of which is not something I'll cover today, but nonetheless, it's our trade idea. But the question is, how do you trade it? How do you go from an idea about what the market might do to trading it? This is where your playbook comes in. It provides you with a framework to execute your idea using known low-risk, high-payout strategies. You'll see an example in a minute. But first, the market can move from A to B in any number of ways, correct? And to use a favourite quote by Dr. Brett Steenbarger, not all movement is opportunity. You first need to see the market behave in a way that matches one of your strategies so you can enter with low risk because maybe the idea will take several goes. And as well as keeping your risk to labor cut, your playbook trade also tells you when to take profits. Make sense? Let's run through a real trade example. Tell me, have you ever missed a market move? Of course you have. But what happens when that missed opportunity is a major one? How do you feel? Experiencing disappointment in missing a large move Many people strive to capitalise on a reversal. The underlying principle lies in people trading to regulate their emotional, straight, uh, emotional state. Hold on to that thought. The chart you're looking at shows a sharp move to the upside. And we know people are wanting to put on a trade because that's what a trader does. So you've already got people disappointed they didn't get this move, the move that's been and gone. So the option is to go short and they won't need much of a nudge to get them into a short, right? And remember, people will try to make sense of the uncertainty and randomness and chaos by trying to see some sort of pattern because that's innate human behaviour. And in seeing what they think is a pattern saying the market is a short trade opportunity, the anticipation of reward will lead to jumping into a short trade and the trap is set. So our idea is we want to take the opposite side of the traders going short. We want to take advantage of a short covering rally. But when do we get long? We don't know if our idea will even work. And if it does work, we don't know when it's going to actually happen. And between now and then, price can move around a lot, can't it? Tell me, how often have you heard someone say, oh, I knew it would do that? Yet in the lead up, they entered a trade, took a ton of heat, possibly even a massive loss or two. And then only then does the market do that. Maybe you've experienced this yourself and to rub salt into your wounds, you're on the sidelines, not participating in the move if and when it finally happens, right? Moving along, and you can see that after our huge price up, price did indeed roll over. And we're going to assume there are plenty of new short sellers now in the move. Our plan is to buy. But look at all the possible areas to buy each time price started moving up, only to then roll back over. That's the very real danger of your trade idea, not knowing when it's going to occur. So if all the arrows point to where price turned back up, what can we clear what we can clearly see is simply buying when price starts going back up is going to work. So how do you know when to buy? This is where your playbook comes in. Here's our playbook trade. In the chart you're looking at now, can you see where the long trade as per our idea was made, where the first buy is? And where there is a second buy, can you see where we added to the trade and where the exit to take profits is? But also, can you see where the exit 
that says our idea is not working right now, so we need to get out for a cheap cost. You can see that. The, there are three key points here. One, the cost of the idea not working is cheap. Two, the payout due to adding is much larger than the cost, which leads to point three. So even if the idea only worked after several false starts, overall, you come out ahead. But there's something you can't see. But a high odds outcome is not the same as a guaranteed outcome. So vital to a playbook trade is the tiny cost when the idea isn't working right now. It's this last point that's so important because it's not uncommon for trades to take several goes before the timing's right. I'm sure you can also relate to this, right? And remember the person who says, oh, I knew it would do that. That's only after they've already experienced several losses entering before the move happened. Another way to think of playbook trades is like this. Have you ever been to an art gallery and you see someone staring at the same painting for like 20 minutes? What are they looking at? They're looking at what you can only see if you're an expert, right? Expert to tell if the painting is genuine or a forgery. Expert to notice who the artist is without being told, just by looking at the work. What you're looking at is the trading station of an independent trader who once traded at a professional firm. Guess what? Almost every window shows data for the same instrument. They're looking at many layers of the same onion. They can see what others can't, just like the expert at the art gallery. Makes sense. And that's how they can see the people who jump in and trade in reaction to the anticipation of a reward dopamine spike, the people in a hurry to put on a trade, the people who get out at a loss only to jump back in and take another loss, the people who suddenly have a trade on they didn't plan entering and are now underwater stuck like deer in the headlights, the people who feed the other professional traders who understand how people are making trades based on regulating an emotional state. Specifically, by incorporating the DOM, the time and sales, and range of footprint charts, the trader can see if people are aggressively entering into long or short positions, and based on their size and the quality of their entry price, they can make some educated guesses as to who's sophisticated and skillful and who's likely to get stopped out due to making a bad trade. And let me show you why it's important to know who's buying and selling, and, in, and it involves a recent trade. First, you're looking at another strong move to the upside. But what about our, our ideas? Same as last time? Let me explain. Remember the layers of the onion? Typically, that's an hour's analytical work before trading. I call this phase game planning. You'll see why in a minute. And it's accumulative. What I mean is it joins up with the hour from yesterday and the hour from the day before that and so on. It's like reading a book. You don't start in the middle because you're missing the important preceding chapters that are all connected. Same goes for your trading. So even though there has been a large move to the upside, based on the accumulated evidence from all those onion layers, if price moves into a specific area as marked on the chart, then we have a game plan to go short. I say game plan because on the chart, you can see zones where we can play, like playing fields in sport. Inbounds is where you can trade, but as price nears the boundary, you get out of the trade before price moves out of bounds. Because when the market is moving, trying to work out what to do while simultaneously seeing stuff light up like the slot machines, you're now vulnerable to take trades due to the anticipation of reward spikes in your dopamine. And you know what? There are people who are unprepared to trade, and it makes them very vulnerable to making trades that will hurt them. Because in the absence of all the stuff that deals with the danger, they are now sitting ducks to a spike in dopamine in anticipation of a reward. So what happens next? Once you've done all that game planning, now it becomes a case of waiting for behaviours to align with one of the playbook trades. And that's what you're looking at on this chart, the execution of two different playbook trades. If you remember from the game planning, the first short D occurs in the spot that's open with short trade, but it's not preferred spot. So very offensive here, hence getting out and not prepared to take heat. And then what happens? The market drops. Well, remember the saying, not all movement is opportunity. So we're sitting on the sidelines through that move down. But then a different playbook trade sets up, and it does so in the preferred area to be short, or the preferred playing field. So this warrants being more aggressive. 
And so you see there is an add to the position and so on, which reminds me, some people can't seem to get their trading past one step forward, one step back, one step forward and so on. If you look at their stats, often you'll see even bet sizing. Well, I can tell you in the professional firms, no one sticks to even bet sizing. Think of it like poker. There isn't a single professional poker player who bets the same amount every bet, right? In the business of trading, a massive part of trading success is attributed to bet sizing. And I actually think people intuitive, intuitively know this, but you can't just keep raising every hand. So the issue is when to raise and when not to. In the trade we just looked at, the sizing varied between two trades because the conditions of the trades were very different. When you have a game plan consisting of playing fields individually ranked for trading, and then your playbook trades, which also have their individual rankings, combine they tell you how much to vary your bet, what, what the volume of your trade should be. The flip side of this, of course, is not. When you're even bet size, you can't make progress, and the emotional toll of working hard only to, only to see every forward step reverse on you is that you're primed to make emotional-based trading decisions, right? I think we've all heard this quote from Ed Sakota, uh, famous um, market wizard, win or lose, everybody gets what they want out of the market. Well, the way I see it, in the calmness of planning to trade, everybody shares the same desire not to lose money. So you could say that most people want, want the same thing. But once trading starts, for many people, the actions taken are to regulate an emotional state. And, and that's how they're getting what they want, even when that means they're likely losing money. Tell me, would you find it helpful to receive detailed trade write-ups of trades like the ones we covered? If so, then go to the address on the slide and register, bosstrading.link forward slash GFI. You'll also get immediate access to watch minute by minute trading that reveals the thinking and decision making that goes into a trade. You'll see the layers of the onion lets you know who the traders are jumping in based on emotional based reactions that we've been talking about. I'll just leave that there for a second so you can make it or, or type it into another tab your browser. And I'm sorry I don't have any waiting music, but we'll give it just a few more seconds while I grab a drink of water. So I think a quick recap on who I am and my experience might help you. I placed my first trade over 30 years ago as a retail trader. It didn't end well. And the outcome of the many trades I placed after was that I overall lost money. Sure, I had some wins, but overall I lost money. It took me a long time to realize that those wins were not an indication that I'd turn the corner. It took me a long time to realize that a loser doesn't have 100% losers, right? Um, there's an ad, uh, an anti sort of um, gambling ad in Australia, which said it perfectly. You win some, you lose more. And having your account value either blow out or slowly but surely bleed out, it's horrible, isn't it? The problem is that the reward you get from some wins is precisely why you end up going back to the tables, the slot machines and the market. You think everything has changed, but ultimately end up losing more, right? So to stop the bleeding, I wanted to know what I couldn't get from books and courses. So the path I ended up taking was stockbroking, which led to actively trading the money of what is termed wholesale clients or sophisticated investors, as they're also called. Now, imagine sitting on a desk in a room with 60 other people all trading. You learn plenty when surrounded by your peers doing similar across numerous asset classes. These roles require various accreditations, so you've also got a really sound knowledge base. But when I moved to trading at a proprietary trading firm, holy moly, did the specific trading skills pale in comparison to the skills and knowledge gained trading at a specialized futures trading firm. Picture sitting at a trading desk and three meters from you is a trader doing such colossal size, he re receives over $60,000 per month just in commission rebates and being surrounded by people who once traded on the trading floor. But not only that, when you trade at a firm, you're required to sign an NDA. So all the really good stuff about trading is not on YouTube. 
Now, if you're someone who believes professional training and guidance is helpful, even though it's the best model for development, for most people, it's not an option to trade at a firm. But imagine a mentor who can offer a similar experience to trading at a professional trading firm, including professional trading curriculum. The training at firms is second to none. So if you're looking for a mentor, you want someone with unique skills and expertise learned at a firm to pass on to you. But transfer of these skills doesn't come through watching pre-recorded videos, right? Instead, it's through interactive instruction where you can seek clarification. So that's what you want. Now, trying to do this on your own is challenging, which why there's a need for ongoing feedback on your trading from someone experienced who can see what you're not aware of. So as an example on the slide, the highlighted comments are individualized feedback for a developing trader. Once you've learned the methodologies and playbook trades, then each day before a trade is placed, you develop a game plan for the upcoming session. And every trade you place is a known playbook trade based around many points of evidence. Remember the trade earlier that used 12 points of evidence? So by keeping a record of both your game plan and your trading, each day you submit your work to your mentor or your desk manager if you trade at a firm. And each day you'll receive written feedback. Can you see why professional firms do a great job of developing traders? Imagine if you were doing the same and also receiving feedback. What sort of path do you think it's in trading if submitting work and receiving feedback daily? Makes sense. And of course, a huge part of developing as a trader at a firm is being seated at the trading desk with the experienced traders to guide you during the live market, right? So to round out your development, you want the same live in the trenches guidance because how an experienced trader sees the market versus a developing trader are worlds apart, agree? It's the industry proven approach to closing your skills and expertise gap by trading alongside someone who is there to guide you while you're honing your skills to trade in real time. And finally, let's get serious. You can't transform your trading in a few weeks. When you're learning and implementing new methods, it takes time to develop expertise. Agree? So like professional firms will tell you, growth takes time. Even though you're receiving daily training, feedback and guidance, you see meaningful results in nine to 12 months, but it's skills and expertise that you'll go on that'll go on to serve you for the next nine to 12 years or longer if that's what you want to do. In the mentoring work I do with traders, I really don't care about your profits to begin with. Instead, we focus on coming up with good ideas that have edge. That's one essential skill in itself. And then the execution, learning to identify certain playbook trades and then executing at good areas. Good trading is stuff you can pin up on the wall where you see all your buyers and sells. It's something to look at and be proud of. When everything is based on getting good at things you can control, then it's not the emotional reactive stuff, stuff like what we've just been covering. Specifics you can clearly see to improve upon is how you make progress and your account performing is a byproduct. When you're doing the right things well, accounts perform. PL is not a focus. Here's an interesting point. When you trade at a professional firm, you can't see your PL. And it's something you should think about seriously considering also, not monitoring your PL. And that brings me to the end. So I really thank you for attending. I trust that in your future trading, you can take advantage of what we've covered today. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me on email, whether that's to request a transcript of today's presentation or to ask me about mentoring. And by going to the BOSS trading site, you can join the mailing list and receive a weekly article based on professional trading methods and insights not known outside the industry. Once again, thanks and have a wonderful remainder of the day. And if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer.
So if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm madly now looking at different options on my uh, interface here, the webinar interface, looking to see if there's any questions. So if anyone has a question about what we've covered, now's a great time to pop it into the chat window and I have got it up so I can see if see what that might be. So who's familiar with that experience of putting on a trade and then moments later almost, you know, wanting to, uh, ex you know, ex uh, what is it, swear under your breath or maybe even out loudly about why the hell you just did, you know, place that trade. I'm sure we've all experienced that, right? So that's um, hopefully given you now what, you've, what we've covered, some insight into that experience. But I think more importantly is you've got also – some awareness of how prevalent it is in the market. And um, I can tell you that my trading business, the focus of my business, when someone says, oh, what's your business? My business is to provide liquidity to traders on the wrong side of the market. So understanding how people are enticed to act in certain ways is a big part of what I do. And because it affects so many people, obviously you have opportunities every single day. So if I haven't got any questions, I might hand back to uh, Chris, if you're there, Chris, from Ninja Trader. Uh, yes, if nobody does have questions, we could go ahead and do the outro. Um, I will mention that if you want to... Uh, um, let me see if I can find it for you. It's probably worth having a look at the minute by minute uh, breakdown that I referenced earlier. Um, the website for that, if you want to grab that, the link for that, sorry. Now, I'm not sure if that went to everyone, Chris. No, just us. Okay, how do I, how do I share it with everybody? Oh, sorry, I've, I've just worked that out. So you might recall I brought up a slide where I said, here's an opportunity to, to challenge your thinking and see what the thinking's like and actually reveal some of those various layers of the onion that give you some insight into how to understand or recognize traders who are acting on um, basically um, uh, regulating their emotional sides, uh, emotional states. So there's the link there if you'd like to uh, grab that and um, go and experience it for yourself. Take the challenge, see how your thinking compares. Uh, and with that, Chris, yeah, sure, we can um, we can close this out. Thanks again, Adam, for taking the time to share with us today. If you enjoyed today's session, we hope you'll join us for future webinars. Follow us on social media for alerts about upcoming events and other Ninja Trader ecosystem news. We would like to remind you that the information provided in this was that of Boss Trading and not of Ninja Trader. All information was for educational purposes and should not be construed as trading advice. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you in future webinars. Happy trading from all of us at Ninja Trader Ecosystem.